From Los Angeles to a worldwide audience, this is Boaz Power TV, where we take your life to the next level. Now, internationally known speaker and author, here's Boaz. Hi, welcome to The Power Show. You are part of The Power Nation, and I'm so glad that you're here. Here we help you improve your attitude, your relationships, your finances, and your career. This is episode number 91 of Boaz Power TV, and I call this one Sea Biscuit Run. I wrote this back in August of 2003. Well, it was a time when most Americans were emerging from the Great Depression. At the same time, a rags to riches, undersized horse was emerging out of turn three. He'd look over, make eye contact with the horse next to him, and take off for the finish line, often winning in record time. These details can only describe one horse, Seabiscuit. There was something about him that gave hope to so many Americans in the late 30s and bonded him to his fans. Well, it all began as a real life story that was turned into a movie. Then there was the best-selling book by Laura Hillenbrand. That was followed by the inspiring movie about a horse born to lose who ends up winning at a time when the average American needed a hero who beat the odds. Now, if you were a gambler, I'm not sure you'd uh, initially bet on the four main characters in this story. Although Seabiscuit has descended from uh, Man of War, he was knobby-kneed and had quite a temper. After all, he'd been subjected early on to beatings and neglect. How would you feel? He was also undersized, not the dominant figure you'd expect in a world-class champion. Then there was his owner, Charles Howard. He had made his money as one of the first automobile dealers on the West Coast. His son had died in a car crash at a young age and his first marriage ended in divorce. Thus, there was sadness in his life when Seabiscuit walked into it. Although he had no experience with racehorses, Howard liked to cheer for the underdog. The third character in the saga was Seabiscuit's trainer, Tom Smith. He was a cowboy and a loner who preferred the company of animals rather than people. He was a quiet fellow who seemed to communicate with horses in a most extraordinary way. He was the early real-life version of the modern-day movie character from The Horse Whisperer. And then there was Red Pollard, the jockey. His family had been doing well before the Depression, then they lost it all. Noticing that he might have a talent with horses, Red's parents abandoned him on a horse farm when he was a boy. That rough beginning turned him into a scrappy brawler, not unlike Seabiscuit. He worked both as a jockey and as a prize fighter. Now, if you're still considering wagering on this foursome, keep in mind that Red was too tall for his profession and blind in one eye as a result of a track accident. He kept it a secret since he could have been banned from racing. However, as sometimes happens in life, underdogs can have big hearts, a huge measure of determination, and a level of desire that cannot be beat. And that's exactly what happened in this story. Perhaps the same thing could be said about your story. As mentioned, the Seabiscuit story took place during the Depression. It involved a wounded horse and wounded men who had been knocked down by life and who got back up on their feet. In the sport of kings, Seabiscuit was the commoner who uh, swept himself and many Americans to glory. In the early 30s, Charles Har Howard, as he turned his back on the automobile industry as a result of his son's death in a car crash, started buying racehorses. Tom Smith was recommended to him as a talented trainer whose horses were winners. Howard sent Smith around the country to look for future champions. It was in Boston that Smith spotted Seabiscuit. He said the little brown horse had a kind of cocky intelligence. Although he'd already run 40 times without much success, Smith recognized something in Seabiscuit that reminded him of the vibrancy of the cow ponies that he'd worked with as a young man. Howard bought Seabiscuit for $8,000 in 1936. He was shipped out west, and the grooming of a champion began. With a special diet to build him up and friendly animals around him, Seabiscuit's attitude and strength improved dramatically. It's not true about people, too. 
having nice people around us, a good attitude, wow. And looking for a jockey who understood tough-minded horses, Red Pollard came into the picture. Although he could be tough with people, he knew exactly how to handle Seabiscuit. So with this unique combination of three people and the little horse that brought them together, Seabiscuit began winning race after race, race after on the West Coast. He beat top horses, often in record time. He had a unique will to win. He loved intimidating other horses, often letting them catch up just so he could sprint to the finish line. He had his way of letting competitors know that he wasn't intimidated. Maybe sometimes we need to fake it till we make it and pretend we have confidence, you know? Seabiscuit was taken to the East Coast to race and eventually to face the most famous racehorse in the country, War Admiral, the winner of the Triple Crown in 1937. Charles Howard wanted Seabiscuit to be number one in the country. A special match race was finally scheduled for November 1st, 1938 between the two horses at Pimlico Racetrack in Maryland. It was called the Race of the Century. Seabiscuit, in his classic Give the Other Horse a Chance to Catch Up, took off for the finish line on the third turn and never looked back. A packed racetrack and 40 million Americans listening to the radio broadcast experienced an underdog beating a 4-1 to one favorite by four lengths. Back on the West Coast to prepare for the huge Santa Anita handicap, Seabiscuit injured his leg and there were worries that his racing career was over. Red Pollard was also recuperating from a serious racing accident on another horse. The two worked on their recuperation together over a period of time. In an amazing comeback for both of them, they won the prestigious Santa Anita Handicap, the richest race of that time, on March 2nd, 1940. Well, I ask you, is there a comeback in your future? Seabiscuit proved that underdogs can win. And let me show you how I made my comeback after making some bad decisions with money a few years ago. Here are some things that I did that helped me dramatically. Maybe they can help you if you're going through financial challenges to get your power back with money. Lower your expenses. Lower your expenses. Live a little below your means for a while. Pay in cash. Don't buy anything on credit cards. That's somebody else's money. Pay in cash. Number three, pay off your debts. Start with the smallest one first. There is a lot of power in being debt-free. You'll love it. And number four, save some money. Cash is king. Save some money. Those are the four steps that help me to make my comeback. If you like these messages and many people around the world find them highly beneficial, please forward this to five people you know. Suggest they go to my website, boazpower.com, and they can subscribe to the free weekly broadcast of Boaz Power TV. Maybe we can help them to also have a great comeback. You are special. You are unique. You are destined for greatness. I see it in you. You are a champion. Have a powerful day. This has been Boaz Power TV. To comment, see other episodes, or to subscribe to this free broadcast, go to our blog at boazpower.com. That's boazpower.com. We're here to take your life to the next level.